Yeah, there, there's this giant mess. Like you said, the difference between the simulator and real life also gets at that somehow, that there is uh, somehow the, the fear of death, all of that beautiful mess comes into play. Like, is there a comment you can make on commercial flight, like with Sully landing uh, that plane famously uh, versus the simulator, all of those discussions, is there some... Well, it's it's very it's very similar to what I was talking about earlier with the A6. So, one is when you're flying with a crew, uh, there's standardization. So you got to remember when Sully flew, when his first officer, that's the co-pilot, showed up. You know, it's the first time they met, and this happens all the time in the commercial world. You know, there's six, seven thousand pilots at United Airlines. You know, your chance of flying with the same guy all the time is slim and none. Where in the Navy, we were crewed, so I had a primary and a secondary Wizzo that flew with me. For how for months? Oh, oh yeah, for like wow. all of the deployment. So because but you want to get to fuse. know, you have to <laughs> trust it, and well, all of those things. It increases the capability of the airplane. It's not to say we can't swap out, but for true effectiveness, especially in very complex wow. missions like uh, uh, a forward air controller, where we're in the air actually controlling ground assets and supporting ground troops. Um, if you're in a high threat area, which is crazy busy. You have to you have to be melded when you do that. You have to have trained to do that job. Otherwise, you're going to be ineffective. So when you get to the commercial world, and I've got tons of friends that fly commercial, um, there is a standardization. Like we know that at this point, I'm going to put this switch. You're going to do that. And everyone, they know their roles. Captain's going to do this. First officer's going to do this. And they know that when the emergency breaks out, so in Sully's case – when they take the birds and they know they've got a problem. And if you've listened to the cockpit recordings of him, the two of them talking, you know, you got to remember they're talking to each other when you hear the full tapes, but they're also talking to the air traffic controllers in the New York area. And it's like, oh, we got a bird strike and the first officer already knows, hey, silence the alarm. They silence the alarm. The first officer is pulling out the book. He's going through the procedures while Sully's actually flying the airplane, knowing that they've lost their motors. And you got to think of his decision process. Like they're trying to get him to go into an airport into New Jersey. And he realizes not happening. We're going to put this thing. And he made a decision soon enough so that he could prepare everyone on the airplane that he was going to put this thing in the Hudson River. And he did it flawlessly. I mean, every single person walked away from that wreck. The only thing that didn't survive was the airplane, you know, and it got fished out of the Hudson. But um, what is it about those human decisions he had to make? Is that something you put into words or is that just deep down some instinct that you develop as a pilot over time? It's when we, when you train, uh, you know, and aviation is a self-cleaning oven. So if you make bad decisions, <laughs> you're, you're, you're and the list is long and distinguished of those who have died by making bad decisions. Oh man. Um, so when you look at what he did or the way we train, because the, the commercial industry and the Navy and the Air Force for all that, we have what's called, we have emergency procedures that we have to know. Like the engine's on fire, the first three steps, you just have to know what they are, right? So they know. The airline, uh, same type, you know, they go, hey, I know this is, they pull the book out because the airplanes are designed, they're built to have some time. But there's a point where you have to make a decision and you can't second guess it. So when he decided, I'm putting this in the Hudson River, he couldn't all of a sudden halfway through it go, well, maybe I can get over to that airport. He he looked, he made a quick assessment. This is that 80% solution where you go, these are not, I'm, you know, it's, it's like a multiple choice test when you go, oh my God, I don't really know the answer, but I know A and D are wrong. Yeah. Gone. So the Jersey airport and going back to LaGuardia, gone. Yeah. So what's my next option? Well, the Hudson River's there and that's probably looking pretty good. Or what is my other one? Can I get a restart on the the motors? And then if I can get a restart now, can I take it someplace else? He had to make really, really fast decisions. And then once they, as they, they go that 80% solution, you realize, all right, I'm going into the Hudson. There's the 80%. Get the book out. Let's see if we can get an air start. Because if you listen to the tapes, they're trying to get it air started. The closer he gets to the water, the more he's going, I'm ditching the airplane. So the original decision to, this is my best option right now. This is where I'm going. And you start eliminating anything that could possibly change the events, which they tried to do. And then he gets to that last minute, he says, we're going in the water. They change the plan. They secure the airplane. They do exactly what they're doing. And he does that basically flawless landing on the, on the Hudson. But you got to remember, every, it's every six months for commercial, they go back and they do research in the airplane in the simulator where they train to the airplane being broken. You just lost a motor. You just lost another motor. So they go through this extensive training 
you know, and all these, and it's, you know, you know, we used to refer to it in the Navy as the pain cave where you're going to get in. Cause you know that when you get in for your check ride in a simulator, that the airplane is going to break, you're going to lose hydraulic. And it's sometimes they're a problem like, oh, I just lost this hydraulic system, but I'm having an issue on the other motor. Well, if I shut down this motor and I've got a hydraulics, you know, cause there's two hydraulic systems, one on each motor. Well, if I've got an issue with the left motor hydraulic system and my right motor is starting to give me indications, do I want to shut the right motor down? Cause that's going to kill my hydraulic system. That's good. And now I'm flying on a good motor with a bad hydraulic system and without hydraulics, the airplane won't fly. So they, it's a really, they're challenging problems that you have to think through in real time. And of course the weather's never good. It's always dark. It's always crappy. You're going to break out at I mean, it's just all this stuff gets compiled on top of you and it's intended to increase the level of stress because when things happen, like in Sully's case, we like to joke, it's going to stem power, you know, where the functional part of your brain shuts down and you are literally on instinct like an animal. Well, if you've trained so much that that is the instinctive reaction that you're going to have when the main part of your, your, your cognitive abilities start to shut down, you're, you're running, that instinct is ingrained so much into you that you know exactly what to do. And that's so, literally how it happens. So there's no, how do I put it? Fear of death, like in Sully's case, do you think he was at all ever thinking about the fact if his decision is wrong, a lot of people are going to die? You know, I can't speak for him, but I would say there was so much going on at the cockpit in that time. His his mindset was probably, I can do this. I'm trained. I'm going to do the procedures. I've practiced this before. I've done these things. And, I, you know, I'm assuming that in his mindset, because I never thought about when things were really bad, you know, if you're having problems with the airplane that, you know, that I was going to mort, you know, and, and plant it into the ground. It was always, you know, maybe it's an ego thing where you think I can do this. 